Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We've got another episode, OM System Live. Uh, we have missed you guys. I haven't seen you in a while. And I know this is a different time than we normally do it at. We've moved it a little bit forward this afternoon, evening, because we have two guests this week, um, one from state, the United States, the states, um, like a lot of you guys in here are, and then one from abroad. We've got a guest from the UK coming in today, so we wanted to shift forward a little bit to make time for her so it's not midnight. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people over in Ireland in the UK on our comment section tonight, so uh, I'm sure you guys are very thankful that we're doing this a little bit on the earlier side tonight. And lots of uh, people from the East Coast and a couple West Coasters. So thanks for joining us on the West Coast. I know it's lunchtime, so hopefully uh, we can enjoy your lunch hour and and uh, talk birds. So for the month of April, we've been really heavily focusing on birds and what kind of lenses work really great for birding. Um, and so we thought we would do an episode where we bring on two different photographers from two different areas across the globe and um, get their experiences on the types of birding and how they find birds in their areas, which are dramatically different. Um, and so our first guest tonight, you guys might recognize her. She was part of our Break Free program. Um, really cool photographer that uh, we also actually had on a show, our show before. Um, Natalie Gribiena. Welcome, Natalie. Hey, and you pronounced it perfectly, Michelle. I know you. I got thought, it this time. Yeah. <laughs> I practice a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not the easiest, you know. <laughs> Lithuanian, it's not something most Americans are familiar with. So. Right. Right. Um, so let's uh, recap because we've got a lot of new faces, a lot of new names I don't recognize. So hi, if you're new to our show. Um, where are you based out of, Natalie? Well, that's somewhat a tricky question. Um, my permanent home is Colorado. And um, so I, I am a registered nurse. And since COVID, I've been traveling. Um, so uh, currently, I'm working out of Moab, Utah, and um, doing a, a little bit of a drive between Colorado and, and uh, Utah. Um, I've been also working in Arizona and New Mexico. So, um, yeah. And earlier in the, in the, in the year I was in Oregon and uh, Minnesota. So kind of been everywhere. <laughs> I feel like West, West side anyway. <laughs> right. Well, at least now that you're stationed in Moab, you have some beautiful backgrounds going on, right? So you can get some oh, nice gosh. landscape yes. birds, anything. I mean, that's a gorgeous place to be stuck. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't feel stuck at all. And it being uh, Milky Way season right now, um, right. I have these amazing red rocks to to play with. And I, yeah, I love it. It's great. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to pop up um, some of your photos and we can dive in a little bit and you can tell us a little yeah. bit about your experience in photographing birds in all over America, actually, but in central, mid, south, Midwest, parts yeah. of America, I, yeah, I everywhere. Will, I, will, <laughs> I will make a, a try to make a point of, of saying where I uh, took the photos that you'll see today. It, assuming that I can remember. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, uh, this first one here, um, the blue herons are just one of my favorite birds to photograph. And I'm always so excited. They're not all that common. Um, and they're pretty shy. So when I come across one, it's always really special. Um, and actually this photo too is one of the first times I got to use the, the bird autofocus on the EM1X. And I was like, as you can see, this bird was not interested in being photographed. He was deep, literally deep in the weeds. Um, and that thing latched on his eye. And um, it, yeah, I mean, it was it was cool. It was very cool. So um, but I'm going to back up, I guess. And if we want to go forward, um, I'm going to talk about what I take with me when I'm going birding. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I wrote an article recently where I, I kind of tongue in cheek, I said, you know, oh, ho hum, it's just another day where I can stick every 
piece of camera equipment I own in one single bag and carry it around. And uh, yeah, so um, right now I do have two camera bodies. I use the EM1 uh, Mark III and the EM1X. Um, and if specifically if I'm going out birding, I do take both camera bodies with me because I like to have the versatility. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I like to have different focal lengths loaded um, so that I can do either a tight close up um, portrait of the bird or a wider angle, more um, environmental um, photograph. So, so those are my camera bodies right now. And yeah, I know the, the OM one is out and I'm totally jealous, but uh, <laughs> haven't gotten it yet. Um, and um, I, so what I usually do is to put the, um, the 300 millimeter and the, uh, the uh, 2x converter so i get a 600 well i guess with the micro four thirds it's actually 1200 yeah <laughs> the math is yeah math but um so i i pair those um and put those on the em1x um to really be able to take advantage of that bird autofocus and that mm. that that eye catching um, aspect. And then um, I use the the one Mark three for um, you. I, I honestly, I was thinking about it the other day. And I think that like, probably 90% of the time I have the 40 to 150 mm -hmm. on that camera. That's um, my favorite lens. It's a good lens. <laughs> it's yeah, it is. It is my favorite. It's almost always on my EM one, uh, my one Mark three. I just love it. Um, and then, you know, because the 7 and 14 and the 17 are so small, I just feel like, why not? I'm like, yeah. going to keep them with me just in case. Um, and then, of course, all the other, there's there's all the other things, or the lens wipes and the extra batteries and remote cable and, um, you know, water, snacks. Don't forget the snacks. <laughs> <laughs> um so, yeah, you need yeah. something to do if you don't find any birds that day, right? Just kick back and have some snacks, take some yeah. landscapes instead. Just, yeah, <laughs> enjoy the sunshine and the fresh air. Absolutely. I'm always about like, I just love to be outside. So um, I, I, you know, even if I'm not catching good photos, I'm happy to get some sunshine on my face. So, right. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what's in my bag. And it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not very heavy. Uh, it's definitely, I, I can carry it for miles. Um, and I am, I am not a birder that, uh, hides in a blind. I am, uh, too antsy for that. So I'm, I'm <laughs> always walking around. So, um, yeah, the, uh, I guess we'll, yeah, we'll kind of move forward because this is the next slide. So, um, I, and I did want to talk about that. Soon. Yeah, no, you're good. So yeah, I, I do always have my cell phone with me. Um, I don't always necessarily have a signal, but these bird um, apps that I'm going to talk about, they do tend to work with um, without a signal. So uh, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And as a totally amateur birder, I don't, I don't recognize bird song or, or, you know, I'm not the, the, the one who can see a bird flying through a bush and be like, Oh yes, that's a spotted. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I use, uh, the, I, a lot of times what I end up doing is taking, taking photos of the birds that I see, even if they're terrible photos, I can use these bird apps to identify them later and be like, Oh, it, it was a pine siskin that I saw. That's great. <laughs> I have um, a friend that I call and do that. I take pictures yeah. all the time of the birds around on our walks and hikes. And I'm like, Steve Ball, he's an, he's an oh, OM yes. system ambassador. Right, right. Steve Ball, please help me. Tell me what kind of bird this is. He, he gets it every time. Oh. I'm not encouraging the rest of you guys to call Steve Ball, though. Don't do right. that. <laughs> well, for those of us who don't have Steve on speed dial, <laughs> um, the Merlin Bird ID is the one I use. And um, I think on the next on the next slide, there are some screenshots. Mm -hmm. So you can see it there. It's the, I don't, again, what, I don't know what bird that is. Is that an Oriole? Um, 
it says Marlin bird ID. So that's what the little symbol looks like. And, and when you go in, it, it gives you options to start a bird ID where you can just tell it like this kind of size and color of the bird that you saw. And it will try to guess based on where you're located and the season. Um, or you can do what I do, which is the photo ID most of the time. I, uh, I load photo ID in there and load a picture into my phone and ID it that way. And I, I get great results with it. I love that app. It's so fun. I, I have never played that Pokemon game, but I, <laughs> but I kind of feel it's like that. Like, oh, I got, I got this, I got this bird. I got this bird. <laughs> now, does it keep it in a list for you too? So you can go back and see like all the birds, the different types of birds that you've uh, photographed? Yes. Yeah, awesome. yeah, that's what's so fun is you can um, you can keep a life list, and if you've never um, identified a bird before, it it gets a, the app gets excited and like has confetti and says like it's a new lifer, and I'm like, oh, awesome. I got a new one. This um, is like Pokemon Go for bird photography. Yeah. I love it. This yeah, is amazing. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. Like it's so much fun. I definitely definitely recommend it. Um, and I've loaded that in conjunction with my eBird. Now that I'm getting a little bit more into um, into birding, um, eBird allows you to keep um, not just like a lifer list of like, you saw this bird once, but you can actually say like, I saw a whole flock of these birds and, you know, I was exactly here. You can pinpoint it. You can see the last um the last screenshot there is like you can pinpoint exactly where you saw it, um, like how many you estimate were in you saw, um, and that actually feeds back to the Audubon Society, and they um, wow. they do science based on that. So it's like participating in a massive, um, I don't know, bird count, and uh, yeah, it's really fun. This is like um, the biggest group science fair project ever yeah. that we're all participating in. I like yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's cool that um, other users' um, sightings will show up on your map too. So somebody may be like in the area and they see something um, amazing, you know, something that's unusual and they, they might pinpoint it and you can be like, oh, I've always, I, I got to get that bird. So you, you head out to that spot to try and see it too. So that's um, really awesome. Yeah. So fun. So that's, um, if, when I'm not looking up at the trees, I'm looking down at the phone, which I guess, you know, that's what we do all the time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but in this case, I feel like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm contributing to some, to some science as well. So it's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. So that is that is my biggest my biggest tool the, the and and the one thing I would say like do this <laughs> load those they're free um, load those up and they're and they're just so fun to play with even if you're just in your backyard super fun so I like that it's also partnered with your All Trails app that's my favorite hiking oh, yeah. app it's yeah. it's the best if you guys are hikers and you're out looking for animals or birds All Trails is the best. Yes. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's my little outdoor, um, my little outdoor go to uh, sub subcategory there with all trails and the compass and, and then my birding apps and I you know, every once in a while I get ambitious and I'm going to try and, and do butterflies or, or, or dragonflies doesn't, doesn't usually go very well, but I, you know, I like to try. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, so um. I, I have, I, I actually, I have seen a couple of questions here and I did yeah. want to say, I think somebody asked about the, the, uh, the EM5 and I actually started with OM systems. That was my first camera, the EM5. I love it. Um, and it, it, the, the great thing is it works with all of these lenses. So, um, and you get great results. So I, I just wanted to shout out to the to the five mark three users because those are <laughs> it is an awesome camera um and and it will work really well with the with the uh the zoom lenses and the 300 and take great pictures for you so um all right so i wanted to talk really quickly um and of course when we talk about art um it's all opinions so don't don't eat me up internet 
<laughs> um, I'm going to talk about what I like in good bird photos. Um, and I have three kind of examples up here of, um, of the the blue heron. He's against a just a white sky, and um, it's kind of it's just a portrait. And it's it's a simple portrait of the bird. It doesn't really show anything else. Um, and those are cool, right? Like you get a great, um, especially if you get a lock on the eye of the bird, and and they're they're uh, as artistically posed as this guy happened to be with the he was ready the chest feathers he was totally ready he said, this is my good side um <laughs> and i mean those are those are great um but there's not to me there's not a, a lot of interest to it um that you know it's it's a cool bird he's a he's a cool pose but like eh. <laughs> I, would, I don't know i it, like him Hey, I feel I, like it's I his mean, model profile. I always, I always think the herons are they, they are so special. Um, but you know, um, I being kind of more a background of a landscape photographer, I like to do. I don't, I don't know what anybody else would call them, but I call them an environmental portrait of the bird. I'd like to have some kind of clue about where the bird is usually found, what what the bird is doing, um, maybe catch a um, um, interesting uh, behavior um, or something like that. So the the center photo and and I tell you, I was I was a million miles away from that um, egret and. <laughs> Um, and yet, um, and even with the, the, the one Mark three, um, I was able to get a pretty sharp image of the bird and, um, and, and, you know, at first I thought like, oh, this is terrible. Like he's so far away. It's not interesting. And then I, I kind of realized that I was more interested about this photo in what it told me about where the bird lives and kind of what it was doing. So, so I, I tend to gravitate towards that sort of picture, that center picture. Um, the last one is, is the silhouette. And I mean, I love that for the colors. Um, and uh, just very simple. You can't necessarily identify the bird, but you know, I, I like, uh, I just like silhouette. To, yeah, I just <laughs> like the colors of it. So, um, so those are kind of my three categories that I I tend to be in um, when I'm taking bird fo photos. So, someone um, wanted to know if you uh, focus using the viewfinder or your rear monitor. Um, I'm always looking through the viewfinder. Yeah, and um, the the article I wrote, I, I did speak about um, like how I use uh, the settings, the focus settings that I use um, with the with the one the uh, the one X um, and the AF. I I like to um, have the the focus a little bit larger, so the um, use the whole the whole viewfinder to allow the camera to find the bird mm -hmm. um but if i'm using the one mark three i do use like this the tiniest pinpoint on the focus to um get as close to the eye of the bird you know manually as i can right which is always fun when you're like chasing it around, like stop moving, bird, your eyeball. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, trying exactly. to lock on your eye. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's always a a, a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm really thankful for the the um, AI detection AF for birds because yeah. I don't have to chase bird eyeballs around anymore. So that's nice. Right. Yeah. The EM1X and the EM, or I mean the OM1. I. I've been practicing with the OM1 in my backyard a little bit because there's there's hawks that I think are nesting in my tree in the backyard. And it's nice because yeah. I do the same thing. I just leave all points active and I let the camera find the bird because yes. it's faster than I am anyway. Yes. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I when I do when I am using the the one mark three, um, I kind of put 
I pre-compose in my head. So mm -hmm. I'll use the small, um, the tiny focus and I'll put it, you know, a third, um, a third of the way in and a third of the way up or mm -hmm. something to kind of compose the rest of the scene. And then I try to move that to be where the bird's eye is and like, hope I haven't, hope I haven't blown it by pre-composing. Um, right. But you know, that's, that's why I use the um, multi, multi-shot function mm -hmm. too. So that when I do push the shutter, I get uh, you know, seven or eight photos to choose from in case I right. miss it. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. I'm going to push right. us into, is this, nope, I was going to guess wrong. Never mind. Where'd, where'd, <laughs> where'd you photograph this guy at? <laughs> uh, this guy is uh, a pond that is like less than a mile away from my house. Um, so one of the things that, um, you want to look for when you're, when you're going out birding, uh, is a place that has kind of the three things that, that birds are looking for, which is somewhere to perch. So either bushes or trees, um, a water source of water of some kind and, and then like a food source of, of, which usually is, is again, is bushes and trees. So, um, there's, there's uh, it's actually at a, at a rest stop off the highway. There's this pond and, um, and I just go over there and there's always red winged blackbirds. Sometimes um, there's osprey and bald eagles and just a lot of variety in this one little spot. And it's, it's really close to my house. So I, that's, that's kind of my go-to if I don't feel like getting in the car and going somewhere exotic, I'll head over there. Um, so that's kind of lucky that you live in such a diverse little area that you just yeah. pop to the rest stop and be like, I'm going to go birding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. it's, it's pretty fun. Um, and it is right down by the river too. So again, like the ospreys and the, the, the bald eagles will fish in the river. And um, I've seen a kingfisher a couple of times, which is a really cool bird, but I have not gotten any good photos of it yet, but I'm, <laughs> that's, that's my goal. <laughs> Um, this was a very, this was a really special trip. I went to, um, a, uh, National Wildlife Preserve, uh, Bosque del Apache yes. in New Mexico. It's kind of central New Mexico. And, uh, this is where the sandhill cranes go. Um, huge, huge flocks of sandhill cranes and snow geese and a lot of other water birds like spend the winter down there. Um, and, Unlike a lot of places where the sandhill cranes will go, um, these guys are totally um, okay with people being all around them. And it's it's really? funny, it's like being one of the paparazzi when you go down there as a photographer, because um, there were literally hundreds of other photographers along the banks of the marshes taking these photos and the birds were just going about their business and got really close. Um, but I, you know, this one is special to me again, like this is, was with the, the one Mark three. So I didn't have the bird autofocus, um, to use and, uh, you know, still like just turned out to be one of my favorite photos there. So usually you try to get the whole bird, but in this case, I felt like it was a little more dramatic with just the the head showing and the, the, those crazy stocky legs. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people, um, that are Bosque del Apache fans and here. Usually whenever we talk about it, there's somebody that's like, I go every year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can um, see why, like I, I left planning my next trip. <laughs> right. Right. I have not been. And I, um, you know, I've always wanted to go. And then, you know, we were not traveling for some time, but I'm hoping now that the world's yeah. a little more open, I can go. Maybe I'll see you there and we can have like a, yeah. a shootout, a dueling yeah. photographers. Yeah. Battle. Yeah, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so, it's so fun. It, it was one of the best experiences. Oh, um, gorgeous. This, this one hops back to being near the river, um, just where I live. And, um, one of those tricky things, trying to catch a bird in flight. And um, in this case, I was using the the um, the EM1X and that that helped immensely. 
um, to get the focus on the bird and the bird's eye, um, even against the kind of busy background. So, um, you know, I like this one because it does start to show a little bit more of the environment behind the bird and it's not just that that basic portrait um yeah <laughs> I, I like this one i'm impressed that you got a bird in flight with the 300 and the 2x teleconverter like that's i'm i'm not that talented i'm a i'm very good at birds on a branch <laughs> well, yeah kind of well, like... i mean the uh the image stabilization on the uh because yeah. Yeah, without that, I, I accidentally had switched it off. You can switch it off on the barrel. And I had accidentally switched off the uh, image stabilization, triggered it off one day. And I was like, whoa, I, how Huge can difference. I, I cannot take a photo. The, the It was just jittering all around. And then I was like, oh, I flicked it back on. Said, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> right. So it is amazing the difference that that makes. Um, yeah, and I don't ever... I, unless I'm doing astrophotography, I do not ever have a tripod with me. I, like I said, I am antsy. I run around all the time. So, um, I, that's funny. There was a question about that and I was going to save it to the end, but I, <laughs> but you answered it. So there you go. She did not yeah. use a tripod. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the only way that you could get a good, um, stable image without the, uh, the image stabilization would definitely be with a tripod. And I, I just, I just don't have the patience for it. I want to be moving. <laughs> it's totally fair. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that's best. That's Boss Del Apache again. Um, and this one really, um, I, I, it was the first time that I had both the EM one X and the, the one, um, the one Mark three. Oh, I've confused it. Look, it says one X Mark three. I'm sorry. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> um, well, it was it, it was with the EM one X, um, and uh, it was the first time I was using the bird autofocus, and I was really trying to see what I could like, what limits could I push it to, and um, it was kind of cool pointing it at the flock of birds and seeing all the boxes light up. There were, I think, it does nine. Am I, am I right? I think it tries to focus on nine different birds, which in a flock, like it really was, it was quite confused, not confused. It was like, <laughs> it's a lot of birds to focus Ooh. on. But still, um, you know, it focused, it honed in on the one in the center um, the, for the most part. And then, of course, some of the others are in the right field of view. And I just I just think it looks like such an interesting thing. And this is how the snow geese like always are. They're in these huge flocks. So it really, I felt like gave a good, um, again, like environmental picture of it, doing something, the, doing something that it does and, or, the bird is doing the thing that it, it always does. <laughs> I uh, just want to give a shout out to one of my coworkers is in the chat, Mike. Thank you. He is helping out answering questions about OM1. So awesome. As always, Yay. we love when you guys help each other down there in the, uh, <laughs> the comment section with other people's questions when we're still going because it takes a giant community and it's awesome that you guys are supporting each other. Awesome. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, saw, no. I just saw some action. <laughs> All right. Oh, that one's cool. Oh, is that an eagle? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about interesting behaviors. This one was one of my favorites for that. So again, this is at Bosque del Apache. And there's this one dead tree that kind of stands out. I'm sure that folks who have been there are like, oh, yeah, I know that tree. Um, it just kind of stands way out in the water. And um like just makes this amazing scene and um the bald eagle or a few bald eagles i think there's there, there's a family there um they frequently will come and perch on that at, at sunrise and sunset and um this day obviously the uh, the red winged blackbirds were um wanting to keep close track of him so they were all like kind of swarming around him and he was just sitting there like unconcerned <laughs> king of the king of the tree um so i you know of course there's this gorgeous pastel sky and i mean how can you how can you go wrong with that um 
and I, I think um, people may have noticed or may not have noticed, but my, I, as I've learned more about birding and I've taken more tips from um, Steve Ball and, and Ben, uh, Ben Knut and some of the other OM system users, um, I've started dialing my ISO or putting my ISO to auto settings when I'm doing birds. So it's one less setting that I have to worry about to get the fast shutter speed I need to kind of freeze the action. Um, so that's why the ISO is so high. And there is a little bit of graininess to the sky, but, um, you know, it's worth it to be able to freeze that action, I think. So. Right. I'd agree. Do you have any limits on your upper ISO? Is there anywhere you won't go? Um, not really, because it does such a good job of noise reduction, really. Um, I have some shots that are, you know, in the ISO 4000 range, and they're still, they're, they're fine. They're not bad at all. Um, and from what I understand, again, I don't have it, but from what I understand, the OM1 is even better, so. <laughs> um this guy was just so cool. This is a uh, when I was out in Oregon, um, and the flock of of um, pelicans was out on this rock. And again, this is super far because this was a three hundred millimeter range, and the, and the birds not not big. I did crop somewhat um, on this one, but it just this weird like I don't I don't know what to call that behavior with him throwing his head back and his his flap there like a sail, but I, I just thought it was so cool. And I was trying to take, take as many photos of the water birds as I could. Cause I, you know, I'm landlocked most of the time. So right. it's fun to be by the ocean. Well, Rebecca will tell us, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she has miles of ocean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, this again is is one of those uh, kind of more environmental. I included um, more of this scene, um, partially because it was so far away, but also just because it adds interest to the to the bird and what it's doing out there. So that's awesome. I think I think this is our last photo. Yes, yeah. this one is. Yeah, this one is one of my favorites. I think that I've um, ever taken really. Um, again, at Bosk and the light coming through those the trees, like I, I'm all about the light, really. So um, this just seemed like such a timeless scene, like it could have happened 10,000 years ago or yesterday um, with the birds flying in and um, the golden light coming through those trees. So I just wanted to end on one of my favorite photos. Yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous. It's very like it feels like early morning to me. Like yeah. having a cup of coffee and watching the birds fly by. I like I, I, I can assure you it was quite early. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm a bad bir birder because I don't like to get up that early to catch yeah. them. <laughs> it was it was rough. It was a sacrifice I was willing to make though. Um, so um and that's yeah, so that's my last slide. Um and I, I did see some friends in there, so I wanted to say, to to say hi to um, Bill. I know I see Bill in there, um, in the comments. I saw him earlier. Say hello, mm -hmm. and Faith. Uh, so hi guys. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Good That's to have support awesome. out there. Right, right. I love when uh, nobody supports me anymore because I'm always on this show. Oh. They don't, they don't come watch me. Well, Mike's here. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with us and sharing yeah. your images and kind of talking about how you like to shoot. Um, I'm going to bring on our friend Rebecca, if you don't mind, and okay. we'll have you come back on the end. We'll say goodbye to everybody. Sounds good. Thank you so <laughs> much. All right, Rebecca, you're on. You're on. We'll say good, good afternoon to N Natalie. Bye bye. Good bye -bye. Well done, Natalie. Lovely to see you. Wow. Hello, Rebecca. How are you Hi. doing? I'm very well, thank you. A lot better than I have been, having just tested negative for COVID for the last two days after 10 days of misery. Woohoo! So we're on we're on the upswing, hopefully. We're on the up. We're on the up. I'll be out oh. there tomorrow, back out in the field. So yes, very well. Thank you. Nice. Um, and okay, so you're going to do a bit of an introduction to yourself. 
Uh, so I'm going to yeah. bring your, you up here and then you're going to tell everyone where you live because I just learned this was a place today. So let's, let's introduce Rebecca and then we'll show you where she's based out of and what kind of bird she gets to see. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. So I'm Rebecca and um, I'm a, a bird photographer based on the Shetland Islands um, in the sort of northernmost location in the United uh, Kingdom. Um, and uh, I, well, as you can tell, I haven't got a Scottish accent. I'm uh, English. I was brought up in Cambridge, actually, spent a lot, spent most of my life down in the landlocked counties of uh, southeast England. But um, after nearly 20 years of coming up with my partner birding in spring and autumn and in the summer to help with seabird work up, up here on Shetland. In 2013, we made the decision to move here full time. So we've been living here ever since um, and absolutely loving it. So uh, we, we, run a, we run bird tours. We have a no, uh, called the NOS boat, Shetland Seabird Tours. So that's a seasonal, seasonal wildlife filled uh, boat trip that we do from April to October. And we do sea, uh, seabird and um, bird survey work. And more recently, um, I've been doing a lot more um, photography using the OM system, which I just started using uh, at lock in lockdown in January, 2020. I made a, what was for me at the time, a massive decision to move uh, brands. And it, I, was, I was quite, you know, I kind of uh, was at a low point maybe with my photography and changing brands over to, Olymp uh, to what was then Olympus has just given me the massive positive uh, boost that I needed in my, in my work. So uh, that's what I've been doing ever since um, and thoroughly enjoying. So as you can see from this little map here, I just wanted to tell those of you that don't know where Shetland Islands are. So we're kind of in, a, in um, it's kind of an archipelago pelago of over 100 small islands, uh, 16 inhabited ones, um, right up in the north. So we're surrounded on the west by the Atlantic and, uh, and the north and the east by the North Sea. And we're about 100 miles from Scotland to our west and about 140 miles from Spitsbergen in Norway. So it's quite an isolated uh, isolated group of islands up there and um, yeah it's just a an absolutely fantastic place to live if you're if you're a birder so I've been birding all my life um, was brought up in a birding family I spent a long time actually in the states when I was younger in my early 20s in Cape May in New Jersey doing a lot of birding and um, if you live in the UK you would know, you'll know that the Shetland Islands is kind of like the mecca of birding really so just because of its geological or geographical location um, in the summer months, it draws in over a million seabirds. Um, and in the spring and the autumn, it has an incredible migration. So just incredible birds, both ones that you'd expect that are moving, say, in spring from the continent up to uh, Scandinavia to, to breed. But also it gets really rare birds, which um, we get really fired up about. So it gets on very strong westerly winds. You get a lot of American birds that make landfall in Shetland which we love. <laughs> and um, <laughs> equally, you have these incredible, strong easterly winds, um, which is maybe more what, what Shetland's famed for, strong easterlies, which can bring in birds from sort of Siberia and Russia. So it's like sometimes in migration season, you go outside, it's just like Christmas come early. You just don't know what you're going to see, what part of the world it's going to be from. Um, it's a very exciting place to live and as a birder and a, as a photographer as well. So that's uh, a little introduction there. We've got the Shetland flag as well there just to show. <laughs> I just like um, that you took something that you enjoyed, like a, 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 a vacation project or somewhere that you went to visit a lot and then turned that into, I'm going to live here and I'm going to make a career yeah. out of it. And I'm just really excited that you got to do that and live that experience. That's so cool. Like, I'm just going to do this. And yeah. now we have a tour company on what is yeah. the smallest island I cannot yeah, believe it. Small. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a strange thing to do because I've I'd heard a lot of times people go on, you know, it's one thing to go somewhere somewhere on holiday, it's another thing to move there, actually to live. But, right. but we haven't um looked back at all. It's exactly what we wanted to immerse ourselves in birds and for me with the photography. So yeah, it couldn't couldn't be better, really. An incredible place, just such a, a very friendly community. There's only 20, there's 23,000 people live on Shetland. And now I live in Lerwick, the town of Lerwick, which is one of the biggest fishing and harbour towns in Europe, actually, it's very busy. And there's only about 7,000 people that live in our, in our town. 
it's quite a lot for the small maybe you think it's quite a lot right. of people actually for a small set of islands but um yeah 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 we love it um so all right so yeah. what's in your bag what do you carry with you when you go um so until very recently uh, as in until last month uh i my my main gear was my EM1X, which I absolutely loved. Similar in style to something I'd had before with a nice big grip. I was used to a bigger style format, you know, camera. And I had the, or have my favorite lens, which is the 300 F4, which for, I mean, I, I haven't, as you can see, I haven't got, I haven't uh, uh, got the 150 to 400 yet, but I find that prime 300 F4, the most beautiful lens for bird photography. So I'm incredibly happy with that. Uh, I mix and match with the times two and 1.4. I actually use the 1.4 with the 300 for nearly all my bird photography. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, more recently uh, got the m most beautiful OM1, <laughs> which I am now using as my main lens, uh, main camera body, sorry, with my with the 300 and the 1.4. And I also love insect photography. I have the macro 60 times uh, 60 mil for that. And when I bought the OM1, I bought the kit. So I had the uh, the 12 to 40 millimeter as well, which I absolutely love. I wasn't expecting. It was kind of like an, you know, I, I, I just saw it there as part of the kit. And I, I knew I was going to Iceland on a little trip and that I maybe wanted to photograph some waterfalls and stuff. Uh, and I'd realized I only had, you know, the, the telephoto lens really for bird photography. So it was going to be pretty difficult to photograph waterfalls. Um, <laughs> so I was really delighted to get that little lens because that, you know, that made my trip actually, being able to handhold uh, hand waterfalls and get that lovely uh, long exposures um, and the curtain style water with that. Yeah, it made my trip. So yeah, that's my, that's my kit bag. Nice. Nice. I love the 12 yeah. to 40. It's my hiking yeah. lens. It goes everywhere. Does it? Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, I think it's going to f going to for me now. I, I can't imagine not having it just as a you know, as an op as an option really. Um, well, and it's so nice and small because I always have one of my when I hike, I always have a telephoto lens on my camera because I'm usually trying to find birds or things like that. But yeah. then when I need something else, it's like lightweight. It can come in my purse or my backpack and just pop right out. So it's yeah, very convenient. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, glad that, I'm glad that you got to experience it in Iceland. <laughs> yeah, it was just incredible. I mean, I, I find the whole setup for me, all all the, all the different situations there that are incredibly light lightweight situations from what I was used to over the years. You know, carrying around heavy stuff, it was like carrying a small child with me a lot of the time when I was out <laughs> in the fields. Uh, right. Whereas now, having something on my shoulder, I barely know is there. You know, I can be out in the field all day. Um, so you know, Shetlands are. Um, as you as you saw there is a string of islands so there's a huge coastline very rugged coastline um, there's it's full of hills in um, more inland uh, and it's got a very um, yeah what would you say oceanic climate um, a very mixed weather a lot of overcast uh, windy days um, and being out all day carrying this lightweight gear and also you know stuff that's now so so waterproof or at least you know uh showerproof whatever it's just uh yeah it, 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 it's just perfect for the weather on Shetland to be honest I've never heard the term showerproof before with our cameras <laughs> but I love it that's my new thing it's showerproof that's it's showerproof moving, well, moving forward it's showerproof <laughs> yeah. there's a photo later where I felt I was in a shower so you I, I, <laughs> so you somebody just ask a quick question, and I think you kind of answered it because you said you use the the them interchangeably. But how often do um, oh gosh, pop up there, buddy? Do you find you're using the teleconverters with the three hundred? Is it kind of always or just sometimes? So I'd say there are two kind of types to my photography. I guess doing a rare and scarce bird photography during migration. A lot of the time, it's just about getting as close as I can to the subject, just getting the, big, the biggest picture possible. So for that, I'm, I mean, I'm always using 300 with a 1.4 actually. Uh, mm. I, I actually didn't have the times two till more recently. So I'll probably use the times two next next uh, autumn for, the, for rarity photography. So yeah, I, I use that um, 
that setup. But in the summer, and if I'm in, if I'm doing hide work, closer work, um, or I'm out doing seabirds, if you can get fairly close, then I just just use the 300. I mean, nothing beats the Prime 300. The quality of the imagery is just beautiful. So if I can get to get situations where I can just use that, then I will. And also. Um, I mean, I've only just last week went out or two weeks ago um, for the first time with the OM1 um, and the um, 300 on on the boat. At the, so it's just the beginning now of the seabird season. And I went out, I'll show you in a, in, in a couple of photos uh, time, but that, just the 300 is just, just perfect. So it's much more, you know, it's tricky anyway, shooting on a rough sea or, or sometimes a rough mm. sea or, you know, a constantly moving uh, water source <laughs> so I find the 300 if I can much more preferable than than than, than the times converters for that that makes sense yeah, yeah. all right yeah this so. is just a little bit of, um I mean I know Natalie's covered it's in a way it's a similar thing um I guess I don't use the same kind of apps and things I have one uh, one app, which is the Collins Bird Guide, which is a fantastic bird guide. I guess it's similar to your, what would it be, the Sibley Guide or something. Um, yeah, the Collins Bird Guide I have as an app. So that if I ever get caught out with something, I mean, I know what most of the birds are, but you know, you're always in a way hopeful that you might come across something rare that you don't know what it is, some first winter or first year American warbler or something when you're out on a cliff walk. So I have this Collins Guide app. And you know, if I if I really need to uh, look up something or if someone asks me something, then I can quickly look at that. It's a really good, I think it was about 15 pounds, which would be about what, $30 or something. And it's a lovely, it's a lovely app to go to have on you uh, as a, a kind of little backup, really. Um, yeah, other things that I do before I go out, I I'm always checking the weather because you know you have. They say that you have, you can have all weathers in one day on Shetland, and it's true. So it's very difficult sometimes to choose what you're going to do. Uh, so yeah, I check the weather forecasts and the tide times too for photographing uh, waders, shorebirds, uh, or otters. It's all very tide dependent. Um, there are some amazing uh, groups here. We have these local WhatsApp groups. So you have the common, rare, and scarce WhatsApp group. So people are sending in when they've spotted something, how many there are, uh, and where, where it is and when. So you can always follow those. Um, and it's good too, because all of those get recorded and put into a database for so that there's a constant uh, kind of um, database of what's being seen on the islands. And um, I guess um, a lot of my work, I, I guess there's three, sta three, three areas. There's boat, boat photography, car photography, and on foot photography. Uh, in the winter months, a lot of car photography, a lot of hide, using the car as a hide um, with a bean bag and going around some sort of favoured spots looking for subject matter, a lot of um, opportunist photography. And then in the summer months, uh, a lot more on foot doing seabird colonies or out on the boat, similarly, uh, just in the summer, really. Uh, yeah, and it obviously helps to know your... To know your uh, your species, your, your what you expect. I mean, going out to look for puffins in winter would be pretty tricky, or or equally, you know, when they're when they're out at sea, or equally with purple sandpipers, one of my favourite uh, shorebirds. There's no point in going to look for those in summer because they'll be up breeding in, in Spitsbergen. So it's, it's you know it's a good idea to have a good good idea of what your of your subject. Um, Yep, I get her licenses too that are needed. Schedule one licenses to photograph certain rare species of bird. Um, but 99% of my work is uh, uh, is is handheld and, and and not using hides. So, question: So, I've never heard of licenses for photographing rare birds because maybe mm. I don't photograph rare birds. So, what happens if you're out and you find a rare bird and you're like, I really want to take a picture of it? Can you retroactively get a license to say like, sorry, I couldn't pass up the picture, or do you just not take it? No, so it only really it's only really counts for breeding birds. So it's for the rare breeding birds on on Shetland. So we have a few like red throated diver, merlin. For those that you need to apply in advance to have a license to photograph them when they're on their breeding locks. Mm -hmm. So it can be pretty tricky because a lot of people will just be going about you know their you know going as holiday makers around the Shetland Islands and come across birds on their in their breeding grounds. But you you can't actively be be seen to be 
disturbing or photographing them during that time. So if you have a lot, you can, you can apply for a license. But I, I think there's only myself and one other that has that license on the whole of Shetland. So, yeah, it's quite difficult to get. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. 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 So right. that's my choice. Mm -hmm. I couldn't not put a puffin in. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, that's you right. You're right. So I shared Natalie's Instagram and I almost forgot to share yours, but her oh, Instagram is Puffin Passion. So yes, we had to share a puffin. <laughs> we did. We did. Sorry, I almost forgot. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. No problem. I mean, you can't. I don't think there's a there's more photographed seabird in the world. There's Atlantic puffin, uh, and Shetland is very famous for its puffins. So they're literally coming in. They've been coming in for the last week or so in small numbers. Um, but by well, um, on mainland Shetland where I live, there's a place called Sumbra Head, which is a, a a big cliff with a lighthouse. And the numbers of puffin there build up over the next few weeks to sort of, there'll be hundreds of them. And it's just a spectacular place to go and enjoy photographing them. Um, I, I have a particular, I guess my, my, one of my favorite styles, if I'm not doing paparazzi style rare bird photography, then I love to do this kind of thing where you're just doing more, more graphic kind of uh, simple, clean natural history imagery. And I love doing black backgrounds and white backgrounds. And puffins at Sumbra Head really lend themselves to, to looking for opportunities, opportunities for background, either clean backgrounds or uh, maybe some bokeh, some or bokeh, I should say, uh, backgrounds. So in this instance, uh, it, was, it was a very brief opportunity I had last summer. And um, it, it, yeah, I like, to, I like to shoot um, kind of F5.6 uh, if I can with the converter on or, you know, F4. And uh, I was looking for clean backdrops and it was late afternoon and there was a shadow cast over a, uh, a cliff in the background. And if I angled myself correctly, that I could get a, a nice sh overshadowed uh, backdrop, which looked black in, you know, with a, with a very shallow depth of field. So that's what I, I, I did here. But yeah, I just, I just felt I had to show an example of puffins. Um, yeah, there's another place on an island called Unst called Hermaness, which has 25,000 puffins in the summer. And uh, you can work with them a lot more there. They're all, you know, a lot of them are at eye level and are walking around sort of biting your shoelaces. And, you know, they're literally, they're, they're very tame. And um, you can really work with them in, early, in really different lights and conditions. And, uh, yeah, I hope to do that later in the summer. Yeah, that was my question. Our Instagram story last week, our Friday favorites was all about puffins. And mm -hmm. I shared, I think I shared one of your you did, yeah. photos. Yeah. Um, but it was, it seemed to me, I've never seen a puffin in real life because I don't live anywhere near where puffins hang out. Um, but it seemed like they were, they had, they had to be very tame or like comfortable around humans because mm -hmm. they did, it, all the photos seemed very portrait. Mm. you know like it seemed like they were interacting with photographers or not caring that photographers were nearby like kind of like with Natalie with the the cranes just hanging out nearby <laughs> yeah that's one of the lovely things about them is that their nature they don't have seem to have any fear of humans at all and they'll be carrying out all sorts of you know just getting on with their natural behavior whether it's nest building or bill tapping and just just getting around getting on with life around you uh so it enables ample opportunity for for photography really it's quite spe very special if you haven't seen one you must go and, you must go and see one I sometime <laughs> i know claire keeps telling me the claires keep telling me yeah. that i need to go see the puffins they're headed there yeah. soon to go see the puffins and yeah you gotta hopefully get a puff, puffin fix. <laughs> yeah maybe i can make a work trip out of it right now <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. oh look at this yeah. glider he is oh, so i was really clean I, this is a long-tailed duck in in um lovely male in summer plumage uh they occur on Shetland in winter uh, and offshore or in small, small sort of raft groups and things. Um, and I've never, you know, I've hardly ever got, had the opportunity to, to see properly close up, let alone photograph a, a summer male. But they're just about leaving now. They go and spend, the, spend uh, they breed up in Scandinavia in North Norway. So they're leaving now to head back up, up there. But um, I was out on the boat the other day and I, it was the first time I'd tried um, flight proper sort of uh, seabird flight photography with the OM standing on the back of the boat um, with a, with the 300. Uh, and yeah, I was, I was really excited by the, 
the possibilities with the, you know I was waiting for the moments really to start taking some flight shots with the uh, using the bird detection and this incredible fast uh, you know um, autofocus system and just the combination of the, you know the bird bird detection mode and the AF tracking was just just uh, it was just bang on I got about eight frames from when it took off and came towards me and all but one were were sharp where I wanted them to be sharp in the head and yeah I was really really pleased with how fast it was and and the results of that so I I like to always put in a couple of kind of my most recent shots because I guess they're the ones I you know I'm most most enthusiastic about I guess when you've just taken something so yeah <laughs> it's fresh yeah the memories are fresh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. this one. They look like they're oh. trying to attack you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have food? <laughs> yeah, I had great fun with these. I really did. This so these are fulmers, um, and these are during our daily tours out to to North National National Nature Reserve. And normally we're surrounded by thousands of gannets, um, who which are which is happening now. Their numbers are building up. But um, and we have amazing diving, like the rockets diving around the boat. But on this particular occasion, there were there were hundreds of fulmers. I mean, we see a lot of fulmers, but not normally in such big numbers like this. And we just uh, had put out a little bit of chum, and oh my goodness, they went ballistic. It was absolutely incredible. And instead of using the three hundred, because I'd got this new twelve to forty uh, lens, I, I I started using that, and and uh, I had I. I had a great time. I was hanging off the boat. I had the, the lens and camera literally sitting on the surface of the water. And that's when I was getting a good shower. That's what reminded me of, yeah, get it, getting showered. And yeah, it was great gear. It was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I took some video too with the OM1 and I really loved, I just, just loved it. Just that kind of, uh, yeah, that kind of sheer mass of birds, the noise, the sound, the, yeah. And, and, and for me, a very different style of photography instead of the the, the close ups, you know, trying to a bit more action, a bit more a bit more wide angle stuff. So I'm looking forward to a season of trying a lot more out using that lens actually out on the boat off the boat. Yeah, that's a really really neat. You're braver than me. I lost my um, phone off the side of my boat one time, oh, and now you? I don't I don't like to take anything on a boat. <laughs> Yeah. I've got butterfingers. I'm not allowed to be in charge of any electronics <laughs> ever. Yeah. Um, but this is an amazing shot. Oh, 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 that's so I did cool. worry me. It does worry me about losing things like phones and right. stuff. Right. It's going to, yeah, I might get. Wrap it around your wrist like three times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But awesome. yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy it knowing, you know, it was nice because you had the confidence of knowing that, that it should be okay under those conditions. I mean, I wasn't completely dunking it. It was just on the top getting a bit of spray, really. So, uh, yeah, and it, and it was fine. You obviously need a good couple of lens cloths with you to... Right. I was going to say, it probably needs a wipe down after all of yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that was great fun. Right. Oh, what are these little guys? So these are the purple sandpipers that I love so much. <laughs> um, yeah, they're really lovely little birds. And so they 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 occur mainly in... In the autumn time, a lot of juveniles um, stop by, but they, yeah, they, they breed up in Spitz, Spitsbergen and right up against the kind of north Scandinavian coast. But yeah, we, we have them for quite a short period of time, really, over the winter months. So and uh, I absolutely, they, they have a kind of a very, very subtle purple hue in the plumage, but it's incredibly subtle. It's kind of like a grey purple hue. There's a little bit on the nape of the bird in front there, a little purple, a spot of purple, but... Um, I've had great fun with these because they're real, as the next species is as well, they're real, they're, they're real uh, tide line runners. And so you can have a great time sort of just sitting on the beach, doing loads of uh, practicing with the, you know, with the tracking modes and, and, um, and, and sort of pro capture and stuff like that. And I've had endless fun with these, with this species. And this was, this, this photo means a lot to me because it was, um, it was taken with the, well, I just got the, Literally, it was the first day out with the OM1, nice. and uh, the weather was horrific. <laughs> uh, it wasn't not nice at all. I nearly didn't bother, but I was so glad I did because, yeah, I mean, I was shooting at ISO. I normally shoot in 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 the dull conditions uh, at kind of ISO uh, sixteen hundred, and this time, I obviously knew its capabilities were 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 quite pleasing with the higher ISO so I, I pushed it just to, to 2500 and you know it was absolutely fine and I was really pleased with the kind of muted colors that I was getting in the on the, on the dull day um, 
yeah, and, and that was taken on a beach just on the South Mainland called Grotness Beach. And I was just getting, you know, I get very low down on the beach. I actually had a hip replacement in November, so I can't get that low at the moment. <laughs> I would normally prostrate myself over the sand, but it's not so easy these days. But I got this, it was like, a little pop-up chair that you can sit on. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I've got right. as low as I could on my knees anyway. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so I got a nice out of depth foreground with the, with the sand. And yeah, I was just quite pleased with that, with that, with that one. So I do have one question because somebody else thinks like me that I might drop something off the boat. So what kind yeah. of hand strap do you use when you're shooting off the side of a boat like that to keep your camera safe? Yeah, well, I, I've only just started doing this kind of, uh, either yeah, the hanging off the boat with the gear virtually in the water stuff. <laughs> so, so far I'm just using the strap that came with the cap, with the, with the, uh, with the camera um and I just have it literally I have it over me under one arm so oh, I sorry. can still get a good yeah so it can't go anywhere it can't go anywhere I might with it but <laughs> I have to get myself so low in the water with the camera but, well um, let's hope you don't do that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but um oh. no at the moment I haven't got a um well actually I've just what have I got here yes I've just got the just the om just the om one uh, strap at the moment but yeah I probably get one of the I did have an old I can't remember the name now I did have something else in the past which uh kind of had a safety catch under my arm and 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 was for a kind of if I was in out in the field for longer I'd have it I'd have it on and it was a bit longer and kind of hung off the side side off my side so I might get get something like that we'll see how it goes yeah get a float strap just in case <laughs> yeah, all right. Ooh, pretty. Yeah. I like the white here. Is that sand? Yeah, it is. So this was just before uh, when I when I could actually lie on my belly <laughs> in the sand and uh, on the same beach. It's just a, you know a beautiful white beach. Shetland's full of beautiful, often completely isolated. You're often the only person on the beach. There's loads of beautiful beaches, um, and in the autumn you get lovely little mixed flocks of waders going up and down the beaches, and um, so if it's not purple sandpipers, it's sand. These are sandling these ones, and uh, you get turnstone and oyster catchers and all sorts. But yeah, this particular one, again, I I was just practicing. I had the convert times two, con uh, sorry, the one point four converter on. Uh, again, quite a high IS. Um, well, actually, no, it's a low ISO. This was a this was a bright day, unlike the last photograph. This was quite a bright day, so I had to I had to. I had to make a bit more effort to to um, to manage my whites because you know it's very easy to to overexpose. But um, yeah, I liked the kind of sort of slightly ethereal quality that I got by getting some nice out of out, out of focus foreground sand. And uh, yeah, I was quite lucky; it just stood in front of me preening as well, which gave a, a bit of an extra dimension to it, to be you know a bit of a behavioural activity as well. With that very one. cute. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's kind of, I guess, lastly, this is it's showing a little bit of what I, what I've really started to get into over the last couple of years since turning to the OM system. So obviously, I started during lockdown and in a town in 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 um in, in quite a busy what was normally a quite a busy town, and I found that I really started getting into trying to get photographs of of birds doing something different, but with a with a kind of a man made element. In, in it as well um but in a kind of a, a kind of an, in, a, in a nice way sort of seeing the two man-made and nature sort of living alongside each other so in the winter months I was doing a lot of that with with there's big groups of gulls that gather around the ships and stuff in the winter um when all the pelagic fishing boats come in but equally in the summer with the terns so you've got arctic tern and common tern and various other seabirds that actually interact and and kind of uh sort of live and breed very much alongside man and I really enjoyed the kind of graphic kind of shots and the different colors and textures and uh, things that you can get from from the more urban style photography um, so so the like the bird on the left there the blue one that's a big old pelagic fishing boat that had was a nice blue blue color and again with the the um, common turn on the right there that was another pelagic fishing vessel uh, so I, I've been doing a lot of that and I have an app that shows me about marine. I feel a bit like it's a bit like Big Brother. I don't know if you have that in the States, but, you know, when you're kind of tracking boats, you can see mm -hmm. the pelagic boats when they're coming in. So, you know, when you can when to go down to the harbour, when you might get some interaction with 
with uh, gulls and and gannets hanging around the fishing vessels or or offloading offloading you know uh, their fish or yeah so i i spend i spend a lot of time around sort of the pier uh, looking at fishing vessels and seeing what's going on and equally um you get some incredible reflections. I absolutely love doing reflective water stuff. I've only really just started it. It's kind of like the beginning of a big project, I hope. So the bird in the middle is just a, you know, a kind of a, it's just an immature herring girl, not a special bird really in any, in any way. But I really enjoyed trying to get them in sort of a weird sort of sometimes, this was actually a boat, a boat had just passed by and there was um, some boat and uh, hillside colors that were coming up and down in the waves and it just it was just coming past the girl and just just caught that as, as it happened it made it quite a graphic kind of kind of shot so i think i think it's my the way that i can kind of uh i can kind of continue my creativity is to maybe right. concentrate on things like this so i think it helps as well i've been doing a lot of judging as i know um om system is is also involved with wild art we have this competition wild art photographer of the year i'm one of the judges in that and this year i'm judging the urban or uh, it's kind of a human human nature category and so it's kind of gone from from my own little project into also really enthusiastic enthu enthusing about seeing other people's shots and what they can get because there's some incredible sort of harbor backdrops and lighting and things that you can get with with man and nature so i've really enjoyed uh yeah combining those two of late uh and and kind of yeah I, it's also i do a lot of big work for the um kind of uh, acrylic work for walls and offices and things and i find these kind of big bold images like this uh work quite well for the wall for, for instead of just a, you know where a standard bird photograph that might work well in a in a magazine or a book for illustrative purposes there's also this kind of more arty wacky side that i like to show in on big in big scales <laughs> I like that wacky. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think, oh, no, we still have. Oh, I, yeah. oh, I thought that was the last one. I thought it was last one. <laughs> you got one oh, yeah. more little ducky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one's an Ida duck, uh, male Ida. And similarly to the last shot, this is kind of, it just reminds me of like zebra print. It was similarly um, done when actually when I'd first moved over to, to, uh, the OM system in, in uh, 2000, winter 2020. Uh, and yeah, again, it was just finding finding the birds first, which is always quite sometimes difficult. You go to this, this was in Scalaway, which is the old capital in the harbour there. You know, you can go 20 times and not get the Ida rafts in anywhere close to shore. Other times you can go and they'll be right up to the harbour wall fishing for crabs um so it just depends you've got to keep going back seeing what they do get used to their movements and, and yeah this was a this was a lucky day I, I went and I had a few hours with these fantastic birds and this was this was my most my, my most pleasing shot really I absolutely loved the kind of uh yeah the textures and the kind of zebra style which kind of it kind of uh parallels the plumage of the bird as well which I liked I love it. Yeah. yeah. I don't have ducks like this near me. I have like mm. the duck, you know, like the generic duck that everyone, yeah. the, like if you draw a duck, that's the only kind of ducks that are near yeah. my house. And it says that <laughs> they're just ducks. I've photographed them plenty of times down at the Arboretum, which somebody in the comments earlier said, you know, if you're looking for birds, go find your Arboretum. It's totally true. If you have a local area Arboretum, you will find yeah birds um there's lots of cormorants in ours but there's so mm. many ducks so I, that's <laughs> usually what i photograph is like mallards <laughs> like yeah. just like mm, yeah. the most boring duck but they're fun you know and they're really they're nice right. they're like the puffins they like yeah. you they want to hang out <laughs> yeah they're good right. to practice with too aren't they these places mm -hmm. are great to practice i used to spend a lot of time going to uh sort of wild wildfowl reserves and things when i was younger just practicing with the gear it's a great way of doing it when you've got it's quite difficult sometimes to find subject matter. I don't, I mean, yeah. I don't find that on Shetland, but generally, certainly when I lived down south, it used to be quite a task. A lot more hide, I did a lot more hide work bringing birds into me in the garden sort of setup. But yeah. actually out in the field, it could, it could be really hard. So I used to spend a lot of time going to places for, for um, yeah, just to practice with some nice plumaged birds, you know, even if they're in a, you know, Avery style sort of reserves. It's good practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we've hit our hour. Actually, we're slightly over, but I'm going to bring N Natalie back on and 
<laughs> say good night to everybody. But first, before we say good night to everyone, and thank you all for the late nighters um, overseas for hanging out with us as long as you have. Uh, mm -hmm. Rebecca, you first. What is one bird you've never photographed, but you absolutely want to? Mm -hmm. Start thinking, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good that's a good question. Well, there's there, there, yeah, there's there's two that spring to mind straight away. One I failed to see when I went to Iceland <laughs> fairly recently, which was um, a harlequin duck. Absolutely love them. They like the fast rivers. They're beautiful, blue and white plumage. They're really, yeah, striking kind of uh, modern art plumage. And um, and the other one would be probably Stella's. Stella's Ida, which is again a very rare bird, which really I need to go up to Arctic Norway to photograph, but I'm not managing that at the moment. So. <laughs> Sounds I like cool. want to come here. Yeah, it's yeah. Cold. I it's like warm cold. birds. I like I like flamingos in. Flo <laughs> yeah, I like to be warm. <laughs> yes, that's actually I was going to go in the opposite direction and say that um, I was recently looking at. Uh, friends photos from uh, Costa Rica mm -hmm. and thinking how amazing a birding trip to to Costa Rica would be uh, mm. just the tropical birds and those brilliant brilliant colored feathers um, uh, although uh, also penguins came to mind so there's mm -hmm. there's that <laughs> I would agree with you I have two people that I know in Costa Rica photographing birds right now and their Instagram feeds are killing me. I'm like, yeah. oh, that just looks so warm, so fun, <laughs> and so colorful. <laughs> but, but somebody's got to run OM System Live, guys. So here I am. If everybody would email my boss and tell them that we should do this live from Costa Rica, yes. that would be great. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? Like when all yeah. this go, we'll have a birding trip. It'll be fun. Sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you. I know we went a little over on time tonight. So I just want to say thank you, Natalie and Rebecca, for joining us and hanging out this whole time with us. And thank you all to everyone in the comment section tonight. If you're helping out your friends that are asking questions, somebody's going to Costa Rica tomorrow. Congratulations. We are all jealous. Yes. <laughs> rude <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh yeah if you guys want to say good night or anything else and then we'll head out and let everybody on with their days yeah thank right, you thank you thanks everyone make sure to check out natalie and rebecca mm -hmm. on instagram and see all their cute bird photos and we will see you on the next episode next month yay bye